Okay, any questions? All right. Um, today, I guess we will start kind of a new phase of this course, which is to look at controls. So far, we have looked at uh, building dynamic models, uh, analyzing their responses to various inputs, uh, first order, second order. And we have saw a lot of tools available in MATLAB and Simulink um, to analyze such problems. So you should be able to develop from first principles what the dynamic model looks like, and that's where you need information from all other chemical engineering courses. So for this course, in terms of testing, you'll be given the model, and then you should be able to take the model and linearize it around the steady state and develop a linearized model for studying the dynamical response of it. And you will end up with a system of first order equation or a higher order equation, like we saw in the last lecture, which is a second order system. So I'm just going to briefly recap what we did in the last class and then move on to uh, one other small topic for delay. So basic idea behind the delay system and then we'll start putting together a block diagram for representing control system, feedback control system. So in the last lecture we saw basically that when you have a second order system, it makes possible a fundamentally different response than a first order system. The first order system can only have an exponential rise or decay. Uh, whereas the second order system, because it can have a pair of complex roots, can have an oscillatory response. And if it's a stable system with eigenvalues, phase part must be in the negative or left half plane, so it will have a decay but oscillatory response under certain conditions. And those conditions are determined by these two parameters, the time constant and a parameter called the beta, which is a damping factor. And uh, once you take the Laplace transform and go into the Laplace domain, you can get the ratio of the output y to the input x as a second order transfer function containing those two parameters. And we saw that when you plot the response to a step change, um, this is a typical diagram that you'll get going from 0 to 1 as a step change. The response itself can have an overshoot. What, so this is the ultimate place where we want the control to rest as time progresses. But as it goes from its initial state zero, it overshoots and then comes back and oscillates in a decaying fashion and the process of steady state. That's not an ideal state that we would like. That's the ideal response that we would like because it takes a longer time to reach the steady state and the product is off that during that period because it's uh, composition or temperature uh, oscillating. And that happens when zeta is between 0 and 1, the so called damping factor. So this is called underdamped system. Now, when zeta is exactly 1, we saw that we have something called a critically damped system, which corresponds to this curve. There, it monotonically rises to the final steady state one, and it reaches it in, in some sense in the shortest uh, period of time. That would be an ideal state, but it occurs only at a particular value of zeta equal to one. Okay? And uh, for zeta greater than one, we have the so-called under damped system, over damped system, which is a typical curve like this. It takes longer to reach the steady state, but it never over. Um, so those are the possible responses for a third order, the second order system. So if you take a third order system, it can be even more complicated because we will have two the possibility of a pair of complex eigenvalue under real eigenvalue. Okay. So, um, but this captures essentially the nature of the response, either a monotonic response or an oscillatory uh, decaying response with multiple frequencies perhaps. And we introduced a lot of terms. One is the period when you have this decaying oscillation. And the period is the time difference between peak to peak or between zero crossing to zero crossing. Okay, that is the time it takes to kind of finish one cycle. That is the period. And then we define the overshoot as the extent of going over the steady state, which is in this case indicated by A. With scale with respect to what is the actual 
should he say that he wants to be, but a separate response it is B, at one. Okay. So that A over B is called the overshoot, and that is analytically given by this expression. Again, you, I don't expect you to remember this, it will be in the formula sheet, but I may expect you to derive it. Okay, from the definition of what A is, from the definition of what B is, analyzing the solution, okay, the dynamical solution, you should be able to measure these distances and get an analytical expression for that. And the other one we saw was the DK ratio, which is how fast is the DK? So that is the vertical distance C divided by vertical distance A. That's a measure of uh, the rate of that DK. And then the right time is another parameter. These are all parameters that characterize the dynamic response. So this is the time it takes to reach first steady state. Now we to say in the steady state, but it is how fast it can reach towards that steady state is the right time. And it's going to overshoot and then come back and it will actually take a longer time and that time is called the response time. How long it takes to settle down close to a steady state. And the response time is an arbitrary definition because it goes asymptotically. Okay? So you define that I want the final steady state to be within 5% of the actual change that I made, then you can find out, okay, where does that occur at the very first instance, and that is going to be your response time. All these are concepts. Are there any questions on any of these concepts? Definitions that we're trying to define and understand and characterize the dynamical response of a dynamic system. Okay. Now, uh, the last thing that we need to do is the so-called transportation lag. I did not really formally introduce it, but you, you were told about it, I guess, in one of the previous lectures, and in fact, it was in the exam as well. Typically, in chemical plants, the transportation lag occurs because material travels through a pipe from point A to point B. So here, it enters this point, and it leaves this point. So it travels through a certain distance L. And whatever the state of that particular stream, its temperature, its pressure, its composition, whatever its state is, is going to be the same at the other end. The state really doesn't change, but it appears after a certain time interval. Yeah, that is what we call a transportation lag. The chemical process industry that occurs through piping. And these are complex piping networks in any refinery, for example. So, if, and what we are interested in is relating the output y to the input x. Okay, and if there is a delay, I need to know because I'm dealing with control. So I need to know if I put a perturbation in a distillation column and it's going to affect the output from the overflow, and I need to pass that to a reactor of some sort, it takes certain time. So if I make certain change in the inlet to the distillation, how, how is it going to affect the inlet to the reactor? That includes a certain delay. So we need to capture the delay in our um, transfer function model. Okay. So these are the possible responses. If I put a step change in X, okay, the output is going to be exactly the same as the input, but with the delay of tau. Okay. So it's going to be appearing after a finite time tau, but it will have the same shape. So in the inlet shape, I put is not a step change, but some sort of an arbitrary function like this. The outlet has to be the same function, okay, but delayed by this tau. So this tau would be the same no matter where you measure. This would be the same as tau. That would be the same as tau. Okay. So every composition, every temperature is delayed by that amount. That is the basic idea of the transportation delay. And how do we model that? We model that by simply using conservation law. So in this case, everything is considered, nothing, nothing changes, no reaction, nothing occurs in the pipe. So the output is going to be represented by input shifted by tau. That's what the shift function means. X t minus tau simply means whatever the value of y was at t, it will be the same value as x at t minus tau. Okay. Tau itself is a number that we need to know. How do we get that number? We know the volume of the pipe. We can calculate as area times the length, cross section area times the length. And volumetric flow rate is Q through the pipe that is given to you. So if you take the volume of the pipe divided by the volumetric flow rate, that is the residence time. That is the time over which that fluid will stay in the pipe. Okay? So it is affected by the cross sectional area, it is affected by the length and the flow rate. 
if these numbers are given to you, tau is a known number. Okay? So in this expression, tau is known. <coughs> Any questions? So you can now introduce the deviation variable. So because this would be the same as yf at t equals xs at t minus tau and the steady state. Okay? So in terms of deviation variable, then it will become capital Y of t equals capital x t minus tau. Now I need to take the Laplace transform. When I take the Laplace transform, yf t becomes yf s, but x of t minus tau becomes e to the power minus s t s tau times x s. Okay? And where, how does this come from? This is one of the Laplace transform theorems that we saw, the translation theorem. Okay? So using that, using the basic definition of Laplace transform, you will get this factor e to the power minus s tau, not t, but tau. Okay? So this is basically uh, a number. Okay, tau is a number, but x is a variable because it is in the air, not as the mean. So, in general, the input output relationship for a transportation delay, pure transportation delay, is given by the tensor function e to the power minus s t. Unfortunately, it is not a polynomial expression. Okay, whereas the function t f typically expects an uh, similar link, we expect to define the numerator and denominator coefficient of a polynomial. Okay? So you can, there are ways where you can actually use this function e to the power minus s t. We saw that also in MATLAB uh, by doing this function s equals transfer function s. And then you can define your g to be, uh, for example, either exponential of minus s tau and times any other function of s. We can incorporate the delay part into the transfer function model through this procedure in MATLAB. But more commonly, what people do is approximate this e to the power minus s. Uh, I guess I should have it as tau. Okay. Change everything to tau. Okay. As 1 over e to the power s tau, which is equal to do a series expansion on the exponential function. It's going to be 1 plus tau s plus tau square is 20 plus tau square s, etc. It's not a polynomial. It has infinite number of terms. But you can approximate it. You can approximate it by truncating here or by truncating here. And those are called Paddy approximations in mathematics. Okay? The terminology is PAD, Paddy approximation for an exponential function. So one of the simplest Paddy approximations for e to the power minus ST is saying that it is equivalent to a first order delay, okay, 1 over 1 plus tau x. A better approximation is to split the c to the power minus st, a c to the power minus st over 2 divided by e to the power st over 2. Just dividing it in two parts and do an expansion for the numerator and do an expansion for the denominator. Just a one term expansion for the exponential, okay. This is a one term expansion. And it turns out that this is a better approximation to e to the power minus st than the first one. The first one is the poorer approximation because it's just taking one term. Here you're balancing both the numerator and denominator. The second order approximation is going to be something like this. Take the two terms from the series, from the numerator and from the denominator. So this is better than the first, first order. So you will come across this terminology in control literature. Whenever you have a delay, a delay is very common in chemical processes. You're going to approximate that to some sort of a Perry approximation. If you come across that, you should know what they are actually doing. They're replacing this function as an approximation. Okay, now we're going to start this new, new topic of uh, putting together the control system. And again, we will fall back on our original problem which is a heated tank. Okay, so you have a stir tank and you have a heater that inputs a certain amount of heat and you have a measuring element, a thermocouple, that measures what the temperature Tm is and it sends that signal through a wire to a comparator. 
which compares the signal that you have set with uh, the signal that is coming with the signal that is TR. <coughs> TR is called the set point. That's the dial that you will set or any thermostat, for example. TM is the measured variable. And our objective is to compare these two, and if there is a difference, you send an error signal. Okay? This error signal is going to be defined as TR minus TM, the difference between the set point and the measured variable. So that will be zero if measured variable is what you want, the set, the set point. If uh, it's not zero, that means they are different. It could be positive or negative. TR could be larger than TM, or TR could be smaller than TM. So the error signal will propagate through this with its sign, and it goes to the final control element. So that's the brain which creates a control action depending on the proportional. If it is a proportional controller, it will uh, turn on the heating, increase the voltage of the current in the heater, or if it is a steam heater, increase the valve so that there is more or less steam going into it to add a certain amount of Q. With the objective of bringing TM back to TR with the objective of driving the error E to zero. Okay? So that is the feedback controller. And the thing that we are controlling is the temperature of the process. So you're coming in with certain Ti, and you want the output to be maintained at a constant temperature T. Okay? No matter where the disturbance is coming from. What are the sources of disturbance here? What could be a disturbance? Inlet temperature and flow. Okay, so then the temperature could all of a sudden change, and immediately the signal that is going to TM will change. The thermocouple will sense that and say, okay, departing from the set point TR, I need to take a corrective action. Okay? So if TA drops, I need to put in more heat. If TA increases, I need to reduce the heat. Same thing, W can change. Now, whatever the W is, we are going to treat the case where the inlet and outlet flow rate are the same. So it is driven by a pump, not driven by uh, available head. That means W doesn't change between the inlet and the outlet, uh, but it, in, when increasing the flow rate, we're going to have more need more energy. So Q must increase to maintain the same temperature. So W is going to be a disturbance, and T is going to be a disturbance. These are the things you need to be able to identify. You want a process, uh, you may not even have the control block. You need to design the control block around that. Okay. So you need to know what is the variable that you want to control, then put a sensor, uh, put a comparator, put a final control element, and bring them all together. And then be aware of where the disturbances are likely to be. And then build a model for each one of them. We need to build a model for the process measurement. We need to build a model for the process itself. We need to build a model for the comparator and a model for the final control element. Okay? And all these are going to be put together in a block diagram, and that block diagram can be just input into simulator, the way that you see it. Okay? Because each block diagram will have the dynamics captured through a transfer function, and we know how to do that. Any questions on the physical description here? So the process itself is the stir tank, and T is the temperature that we want to control. The measured uh, value is Tm uh, from, the, from the thermocouple, and the set point is Tr, and the final control element is the heater. How does the block diagram look? Graphical representation in terms of block diagram. Okay? So we are, we are defining the measurement error as a difference between the set point and the measured variable. Okay, so we're going to use a separate block for each one of them. Okay, so take a look at it, and can you map, I guess I have put the labels there that can help you, but can you map what each one of the block would be? What would be this measuring element? That's it? Okay. That's the thermocouple. Okay. So I, I am indicating here that PM is the output from the thermocouple. So, but what is its input? Each block will have an input and an output and the dynamics captured by a transfer function. We have seen so far simple dynamics. Now we are 
coupling it. We are closing the feedback so it becomes a coupled system, always an interacting system. So what is the input to the measuring element? The outlet temperature, T, because that's where we are sampling it. Okay. Now why would T be different from Tm? Or under what conditions would T and Tm be the same? A little lag. Okay, the thermocouple doesn't instantly send the temperature. Okay, so if you dip a, thermo a thermocouple or a thermometer into a liquid, it takes a certain amount of time to reach equilibrium, to reach the temperature of the surrounding liquid. Okay, that delay may be very small, maybe of the order of milliseconds in the case of a thermocouple, it may be of the order of a second in the case of a thermometer. Okay, but still, we are going to consider that delay. Okay, so we may represent this as 1 divided by tau m plus, tau m s plus 1. Tau m is a time constant for the measuring element. And it can be very, very small. Now, if it is 0, what happens? If tau m is 0, then T is equal to Tm. So the moment the process temperature changes, the output from the measuring element instantaneously changes. So it follows it accurately. But if t tau m is microsecond, then there is a delay in the microsecond. And I'll illustrate that through numerical example later on. Okay. So we understand the input and the output for a measuring element. What is the process? The process is the heat tank itself. What are its input and output? The output obviously is the temperature from the process. The input could be Low and the inlet temperature, low, what we call the inlet temperature, and whatever comes out from the control, final control element, that is T. Okay. So, can we write a model for that? Can we get an algebraic expression? And what does this summation, why, why do we have the summation in here? What does it mean? Okay. We will see that once we write down the model for each one of the parts. I'm just taking you through the various steps to, to understand the input output relationship for each one of those blocks. Okay. The final control element then puts out a Q, the heat. Okay. So the heat affects the temperature and uh, inlet uh, temperature load affects the temperature. What, 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 what about the final control element? What would that be? That's the feeder itself, right? And what is its input and what is its output? Well, we know its output is Q. The heater puts out heat. The input will be the a control action. The error goes to the a controller. Okay. So here I have in the previous diagram, you are right in that observation. In the previous diagram, this included both the control element and the controller itself. Because it was getting the signal epsilon and it was putting Q. But there are actually two physical devices there. One is the heater, the other one is the brain that decides what should be the heater doing. So it takes the error signal and can calculate how much of more current do I need, how much of the valve should I open. Okay. So typically you will break that into two parts. That's what you see here. Final control element, which is the heater or the valve to the steam uh, line, and the controller. The controller is the one that gets the error signal. It gets the error signal. And uh, here we set the set point. TR is set by a knob. Okay. And the measurement signal comes back and we take the difference. That's why you see the plus and minus. Here you will see why it is plus and plus once you see the model for the particular process. Here the signal TR and TM, we take the difference and that gives you the error. And the error goes to the controller. And the controller is either a P, PI or PID controller. So it receives the signal and it sends an action. That action is going to be how much of current or how much of heat, the uh, output, the heat has the output. Okay. So in the previous diagram, these two blocks were kind of merged into one. So typically, they are two separate physical devices. Any questions on that? No, uh, no. This is one of the simplest feedback control actions. Okay. And once we understand that, and we understand how to put together individual um, transfer functions and develop a relationship between P, 
the output and the set point. If I make a change in the set point, how does the output affect? What is the, how does the dynamic of this feedback loop uh, evolve in time? That's what we want to understand. Algebraically, we can do that in the transfer function space, or we can do it in simulating through simulation. We'll do both of them. Good question. But in Simulink and in most um, block diagrams like this, um, the input and output, each one of them will have a unit. Okay, so what signal is going through is your question, right? So uh, for our purposes, we can say the signal that is going through is something equivalent to the temperature, Tm. But in reality, uh, do you know the controller there on the wall? What kind of uh, signals that it sends in and sends out. It obviously measures the room temperature and somebody has set up a set point, it's only by degrees. Okay? So it measures the room temperature to be 27 and the set point is 25, so it needs to send a signal. What kind of signal does it send? Anyone? Okay. Uh, this looks like an old one, but the modern ones will send the current, okay? actual signals, but some of the older ones actually send a pneumatic signal. So there is air flow going in through that. Okay. So this is what is in my office because I know that I had a problem and I moved into my office and my condition didn't work. So the guy came and said, well, the pneumatic thing, the tube is broken, so they had to fix it. So if you go near it and change the set point, you'll actually hear a hit. Okay. That's basically saying that it's pressurizing to send the signal to the other side. Okay, so pneumatic, it could be a pneumatic convey where it sends a pressure signal. Or it could be a voltage signal. Okay. In reality, it could be, uh, typically these are the two. Hydraulic, for example, we could use uh, in uh, automotive, for example, or in uh, the earth moving equipment. We are using uh, liquid, pressurized liquid to raise the uh, material or drop it down. So the signal should be transmitted either as pressure or as voltage or as current. Okay. Uh, but in a diagram like this, what we need to worry about is an instrumentation engineer will worry about the hardware aspect of it. As a control engineer, what we need to worry about is get the units right. So you need to ask, what is the unit of the signal that is going through? It's the degree Celsius or degree Fahrenheit. Okay. The signal that comes out in this case is also degree Fahrenheit. So this transfer function should basically be dimensional because it is getting in degree Fahrenheit and sending out degree Fahrenheit. The ratio of y over x, for example, if I call this, uh, let me just call it as Tm over T, is going to be this transfer function, 1 over L1 f plus 1. The output to the input, okay? These are all in the Laplace domain. So both of them have the units of T. So they're carrying a signal for our purposes in temperature. Okay. In reality, it will be voltage or a pressure. But in our for this diagram, all you need to worry about is the signal that is flowing is degree Fahrenheit or degree Celsius. Now let's look at uh, uh, the controller. What is the signal that is getting in? Let's combine these two and just look at uh, controller and the final control element. The controller is getting epsilon as a signal. What is the unit of epsilon? This is coming in degree, but that is coming in degree. It's different. This is different. So the algebraic equation is simply epsilon, and the e there is an equation for each block. Okay? And it is that equation that will tell you whether it is dimensionally consistent or not. So epsilon is CR minus T uh, M. Okay. So CR and TM both have the units of the pattern, and so epsilon must have the units of the pattern. And this is this block is that equation. This block is this equation. It's going to develop the equation for this block. It gets a bit more complicated. Okay. And what is the equation for this block? That will also be a bit more complicated. Because I include the proportional component. At this stage, because to raise the question, I want to find out what is the relationship between the input and output. What is the unit for input? 
they get fat and nice. What do you get it from elsewhere? What comes out of it is Q. Okay. Q would be in terms of so many joules, right? And so what you need to uh, what you need to happen is the transfer function that you develop for this entire block should have the unit of so many joules per degree Fahrenheit, per degree Fahrenheit, per degree Celsius. Okay? The conversion should be, the transfer function should have a unit that will be simply the ratio of input to the output for every block. And this is a very common mistake people can make and make sure that you are checking all the time if you have the right unit. And once we go through the example, we will uh, pay attention to that. Does it answer your question? What are, the, what are the signals? The signals going through in reality would typically be pneumatic signal or voltage. But in a block diagram like this, we are treating it as if these lines are carrying signals, but they are carrying different values. This one is carrying temperature, and that one is carrying <coughs> difference, that one is carrying the heat load, that is the temperature. So you sample from the line. Acquiring the same signal, same unit, same value as the line that is going through. So here we are just sampling what happens on this line. So it will have the same unit as Okay, any other questions? That's an important thing to understand. Yeah. How sub M stands for the Time constant for the measuring element. How is the time constant for the measuring element? Okay. Well, it depends on what type of measuring element you have. If it is a thermal couple, the, uh, the manufacturer should give you the tau n, the time constant. Okay. Because it depends on the design of the thermal couple. So, in the specification, you will see that this thermal couple has 3 millisecond time constant. That means it will respond to 3 millisecond period. It is for the process that we need to develop the model and the transfer function and the time constant. But for the other instruments like the controller, uh, in the controller you will have the K that we need to tune that will affect the time constant of the controller. But in the measuring element, the manufacturer should give you what it is. Okay, so let's now focus on. Um, Developing the input-output model for the process. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I noted here is that it is not sequential anymore. Previously, we had input-output. We had several things strung together, and we could find that net output from an input to three processes in series, for example. Okay. And even if it is not in series, you learn how to do that in your exam. But here, it is coupled back. It is feedback. Okay. So we need to have a, a develop a way of simplifying and developing an effective transfer function between the inlet and the outlet. So it is cyclical in nature, the coupled system. Okay. This means everything happening in the loop affects every other part. Now, there is something called a positive feedback system, which would be one where you don't take the difference between the two signals, but you add them up. But you never use that because it's often is an unstable system, meaning when you analyze that system, you will have the eigenvalues going to the right hand side. Okay, so this is really, in principle, it exists, but we rarely use a positive feedback. So what we have is a negative feedback. That is, we take the measured value, take the difference between the measured value and the set point. Now we already talked about this, but I'm just uh, reinforcing this idea that there are two types of control actions that we are studying. One is called the servo; the other one is called the regulator. In the servo control system, we vary the set point in a particular fashion. We put a step change, or we put a sinusoidal change, or an impulse, okay? and we study the response of that. Okay, so the response tracks whatever the set point is. So sometimes it's called a set point tracking system. Okay? So you can change the set point in any way you want, and the system should track that. That's what the set point is. System. The other one is called the regulator one, where it is the disturbance rejection mode. So it is, the set point is constant, and the process is operating on the steady state. There is a disturbance that comes in, and the control action should be to get rid of the disturbance. Okay? So the set point doesn't change. Now I'm just going to ask you a question uh, about. Let me describe a scenario and then ask this question. 
I have a chemical reactor operating under steady state. There's a second order reaction going on. Is that the linear or nonlinear? Second order reaction going on. It will be nonlinear because the re reaction rate will be something like constant times t squared. Okay, so there is a nonlinearity. And I have a steady state. I've solved for it. As you now know how to do that. Okay, and I'm linearizing a model, developing a model around that steady state. My question is, if I use the linearized model uh, in a regulator mode or in a servo mode, which one would give you better result? Why? Right. If you do, this is very important that all of you get the idea behind it. We have already talked about it before. Okay. If you're doing a servo uh, control where you're changing the set point, taking it to a new steady state, then the linearized model that you have developed may not be as applicable. It depends on how nonlinear the system is. Okay. So if the, if the nonlinearity is something like this, okay, this is a linear system, so the slope is constant. So whether you operate here or operate here, the slope is going to be constant. The slope is the one, the derivative is the one that appears in the linearized model. Okay. Whereas if you have a nonlinear system but the gently curves, you can approximate the slope to be the same. The difference in slope here and here are not different. So as you take the system from one steady state to another steady state, the slope doesn't change very much. Okay? Then it also is okay. But in principle, as you go farther away from the steady state, the regulator model would be a good model, the, the servo model will fail. And that is the reason why we need to retune the controller, we need to retune the model itself. We evaluate uh, the new steady state. What are the model coefficients? When we pose these things in the problem, we should understand what it is and how to go about doing that. Okay, any questions on that? Is it clear to everybody? I hear some good response from a few people, but I'm assuming everyone is following that. Okay. Okay. So now to the mathematics. Back to the mathematics. This is basically repeating what we did before. Um, we are developing a conservation law based model for the process. And once we do that, we want to know how to represent it in the block diagram so that I know what the transfer function is for the particular block. So this is the rate of accumulation and rate in minus rate out and Q is a heat sink into the system. Okay, so this is the energy coming in from the inlet stream, energy leaving the outlet stream, energy coming in through the heater, and this is the rate of accumulation of energy. And T0 is some reference temperature. Then we do the steady state. So the steady state equation is given by this, where we set dt time at which temperature is equal to zero, and put the subscript s to indicate that it is a steady state. Then we introduce the deviation variable. Okay. Deviation variable here, I'm putting a prime to indicate it. it's not a derivative, but it's just a deviation variable from the steady state. And capital Q is a deviation variable in the heat flux. Okay, so subtract from the dynamic from the steady state and you get the following equation in terms of deviation variable. So this is the deviation in the inlet temperature. These are the deviations in the outlet temperature. And this is the deviation in Q. Okay, so it is operating under steady state. Qx is the heat at under steady state conditions. As we know how to calculate it. How would you calculate that? If I ask you to calculate, there's a numerical example coming in. How do you calculate what is the steady state heat flux from this equation? If I tell you what the inlet temperature is, I tell you what the steady state temperature, outlet temperature I need, the only unknown is QS. You can solve for it. You can find out what is the steady state heat duty. Really, there is nothing new in that. All we did was to reformulate the problem in terms of deviation variable. Then we take the Laplace transform. So Q becomes Q of S, okay, and Ti becomes Ti of S, and these are the state variables, the temperature. And collect both the temperature term, T prime here, T prime there, that becomes this, and move all the inputs to the right hand side. So Q is an input and T prime is an input. <coughs> okay. 
So here we are keeping W as a constant. There is no change in the flow rate, but I can increase Q. Or I can change T prime, the inlet temperature, T I prime. So both these are treated as input. And T prime is the output. So I have a relationship in the time in the Laplace domain, the relationship between the input and the output. Okay, and tau here is the time constant. I know how to calculate it in terms of density, volume of the tank, and volumetric storage. Okay, so that is a known number. So this is my transfer function. But this transfer function output is affected by two inputs, either by changes in Q or by changes in Ti, the inlet temperature. Any questions on that? This is just a repetition of what we did before. And uh, if there is no load change, then Ti time is zero. Okay. Then I get a simpler transfer function that relates the output T prime, outlet temperature, to Q prime, the inlet uh, T plate. That is when there is no load change. When there is no change in Q, but there is a change in the load, that is, I'm keeping the heat as constant, but I'm changing the inlet temperature. Then the relationship between the outlet temperature and the inlet temperature is given by this. Okay. How did I get each one of them? In the first case, I put um, T i prime equal to zero, and what I'm left with is this term. In the second case, I put Q equal to zero, and what I'm left with is T prime divided by T i prime equal to one divided by tau plus one. Am I going fast? Do you understand these two? The two transfer functions that we derive for the outlet temperature for each one of the two different inputs. I can change only Q or I can change only Ti. So if I have both of them, the two transfer functions are going to be at the top. So if I make simultaneous change to both the heating rate and the inlet temperature, then I have to use this to predict the combined effect on the outlet temperature. What principle am I using here when I do that? Simultaneous change in inlet temperature Ti and Q, and I want to predict the net effect on outlet. Principle of superposition, because it's a linear system, right? So I can simply add the effect. Now the question is, how am I going to represent this in terms of block diagram? There are a couple of ways of doing that. I'll show you and let you tell me whether it makes sense. What have I done here? I'm representing that particular equation. Okay. Uh, this equation, we need to see both of them at the same time. Can you see both of them at the same time? Okay. So the very top equation can be represented in a block diagram like this. So, we did this in similar equations. You remember, this is an algebraic expression, 2 y prime plus 5 y plus 10. Algebraic expression, but to represent that in similar length, it's a complicated process because we need to take 3 e into multiplied by y, square it, and then add it up. Every operation, multiplication, addition, division, is a block in similar length. So, that's what is happening here. So 1 over tau x plus 1, the block that you see here, you can try to use some color codes here, okay, this block is this term, 1 over tau x plus 1, that gets multiplied by tau i, that gets multiplied by tau i. So uh, t i, t i comes in, I multiply it by the operation of 1 over t s plus 1, and I get the output from there. To that I am adding, this, ex this will explain why I have an addition block here. Both things are added, okay, because I have this addition symbol there. Okay. So to that, I need to add what is coming in from the other stream, which is the input is QS, QS, and watch very carefully. Whatever is left goes into the block. So I have a 1 over WC, 1 over WC divided by tau x plus 1, divided by tau x plus 1, okay? So only Qs is separated out of the input, but everything else is an algebraic expression that multiplies Qs. What comes out is the entire first term in the entire term. 
Okay. So now I'm adding these two, and the output is uh, what I get as uh, You should be able to do that. Okay. You run a process, develop the model, linearize it, get this equation. That equation may look, in fact, more complicated than that. But you should be able to break it up and represent it as a block diagram. Once you do that, it's very easy to put it in there. Okay? And then ask the question, what happens if I do a step change to pi, step change to q, different step changes in different directions? You can capture the combined effect of all of them. Okay? So the thing that is new, I guess, is for you to be able to go from this step to this step. Do you feel comfortable enough to do that? Okay. <coughs> now, I said there are a couple of ways of doing it. Obviously, there are a couple of ways of writing that equation. What would be the other way? I could, for example, factor out 1 over tau s plus 1 from both of them. That's the same factor that is appearing in both. Okay. So, suppose I had written it like that. Well, what will change? So it is another way of writing the same equation. What I have done is I have factored out 1 over WC divided by tau s plus 1. When I do that, I need to multiply this by WC. So this equation is the same as the previous one, except for the factoring of the common term. How would the block diagram for this look? Would anybody like to come and try it on the board? Or on a piece of paper you try it? I guess you have it in your notes, right? There it is. Make sure that you understand what is happening here, okay? Uh, again, we need both of them. <laughs> now this is too small, isn't it? <laughs> uh, that's good. You can see both. <laughs> I'll just um, go back and forth. So what is happening is you have Pi that gets multiplied by WC. Say again for the use of color code. So this is the green part, WC times Pi. Okay. And that I am adding QC, I mean QS. Okay. So this is the addition, and that addition corresponds to that signal. Okay, so on the on the both sides of that addition, I have two signals. One is Q, the other one is WC times Pi. So we're always using the fact that the output is input multiplied by what is happening in the plot. Okay. So now I get these two and add them up, and the added signal is multiplied by what? Whatever is that? That's a common. Both the terms are multiplied by the same thing. So I need to. That common. That is what is happening here. So the output is going to be exactly the same as what I had before. I guess I ran out all, all the colors. Okay. That is good. Both of them will take the same input, Q and P prime, and produce the same uh, PI prime and produce the same output P prime. Okay. But the block factor will look different depending on how we have written the algebraic equation that you have here. Both are equivalent. Both will produce identically the same result. Okay? So this just shows you that there is no uniqueness to this process of building the block diagram. Depends on how you write the equation. But what you should be able to do is transfer that appropriately. Whatever the equation is, write the corresponding block diagram. Any questions? That's for the process. See, now let's look at the measuring element. Measuring element is very simple. Okay? The outlet measured temperature is equal to the inlet temperature, which is the process temperature, multiplied by the dynamics of the measuring element. That's sum of couple. As I said, tau m is a number that the manufacturer will give you. Okay? So typically, we model this by a first order system. Okay? So that transfer function is known by looking at the dynamics, but as I said, typically most of the time is treated as a first order process and asked for the time constant from the manufacturer. Then the controller and the final control element. Okay. So the output Q from the controller is proportional to the input 
error, epsilon. Error is TR minus TM. Okay? And QF is the steady state. So <coughs> if the error is zero, what do we want the output to be? QF. Not zero, QF. The heat, the heat are <coughs> If the set point and the measurement point are the same, then the set value is zero. Then the error is zero. Then I want to maintain the heat and I can see. I know how to calculate QF. How? From the steady state equation. This number I can calculate. So this is the dynamic equation for a proportional controller. We should see later on how to replace this with proportional integral, proportional integral derivative. For each case, the dynamical equation will change. Okay? But this is a simple proportional controller, and the equation is an algebraic equation. Now we can put this in terms of the deviation variable by simply taking Q to the left hand side and defining capital Q as the deviation from the steady state that is equal to KP times epsilon. <coughs> AC is the controller parameter, <coughs> the controller gain. So that is the transfer function. Uh, how do we represent that? There it is. Output QS is equal to KC times the input error. How is the input error calculated? From the difference between the measured one and the set point through this uh, comparator. The equation for that, of course, is uh, we wrote it earlier. So it's going to be simply epsilon is equal to TR minus TM. That's where the plus minus comes in. Okay? So the sign is attributed to that signal. So whatever this thing you're getting, can be the plus sign here, can be the minus sign here, and that's it. Attitude that. So we have put together the mathematical representation of the transfer function for each other block. Now I can go back to the block and identify what each one is going to be. Now I have put in the known function. So here is 1 over column x plus 1, 1 over wc, and then over column x plus 1. And this is the block for the entire process, q and q plus. Output from KC is the same as input in the next one. That's where I couple that. Similarly, really the output from the rushing element is the same as the input to the comparator. This is something that I said. I put together the entire block diagram. I can now take it to similar. Okay? And treat KC as a number that I can play with and see how does the dynamics of this feedback control system changes as I change KC. Sometimes you'll find that when I change KC, it becomes unstable. Then you need to ask what? What happens to the characteristic group? Does it go to the right hand side? Obviously. Okay? So those things we will illustrate through a specific example in the next class. Okay? Through numbers and through MATLAB illustration and through like illustration. Okay, I think we'll probably stop that there. <coughs> <coughs>